Hi everyone, I'm Michael and in this video I'll talk about my work on expected polynomial runtime in cryptography. Our main focus are zero-knowledge proof systems. So a quick recap, we have a prover and a verifier and this language, this NP language, um, where the prover has a statement and a witness and the verifier wants to be convinced that X lies in the language and they interact and in the end the verifier outputs its verdict whether it accepts the claim or not. And zero-knowledge says that the verifier cannot learn anything uh, from this interaction and it's usually formulated um, as follows. So it's usually formulated as existential zero knowledge, um, which says that for every verifier there exists a simulator such that the output of the real protocol of the verifier and the output of the simulator are indistinguishable and the simulator does not get the witnesses input. A stronger notion of zero knowledge is universal zero knowledge. Here, the order of the quantifiers are swapped. So the simulator is universal for all adversaries. There exists one simulator, and this is given the code of the adversary, and then it works for any adversary. And an even stronger notion of zero knowledge is black box zero knowledge. Here, the simulator is universal, and it does not even get to see the code of the adversary. It just gets access to the adversary as, as a black box. And I've closed over one detail here, namely the running times. So I use expected polytime simulation here, but strict polytime adversaries. And this actually induces an asymmetry. And this, is, this kind of breaks the promise of zero knowledge, um, which states that everything the verifier learns, uh, it could simulate itself because this verifier cannot run the simulator. And also you run into composability issues um, because after replacing an adversary by a simulator once, um, you will now have an expected time adversary, which you cannot handle anymore um, because we cannot only handle PPT adversaries here. So there are two ways out. We could require the simulator to be PPT or we could allow the adversary to be EPT. And we'll look at the latter. And with this choice, another implicit assumption uh, becomes more apparent. Namely, with PPT adversaries, one usually assumes that they are well behaved in any environment. So there is this one polynomial bound and it will hold no matter what machines uh, the verifier interacts with. For expected polytime verifiers, this is not so clear anymore. And well, let's see why we look at this setting and what setting we look at now exactly. So why do we want to look at expected time simulation? The main reason is that strict polytime simulation is impossible in the plane model for constant round black box zero knowledge uh, with negligible soundness error, which is a result due to Barak and Lindell. Um, and they also show that similar impossibilities uh, hold for proof of knowledge. And the relaxation of adversaries or the strengthening of adversaries um, to designated adversaries, which only need to be efficient in the protocol uh, they are designed to attack, is, it's very natural in the expected policy setting. Uh, but it turns out to be somewhat tricky to deal with. Um, but in some sense, you do have to, to deal with this. You have to decide on a notion. And we go with this very natural notion. And in the rest of this talk, we will mainly focus on expected polytime verifiers and the designated verifier aspect comes naturally. We will, as our running example, uh, use the graph 3 car ring protocol. Um, so a quick reminder, this is the classic graph 3 car ring protocol. We have a verifier and a prover, and the prover knows the graph and the 3 car ring. And it will first randomize this 3 car ring and then commit to all the colors and send these to the verifier. The verifier will choose a random challenge edge and the prover will then open the colors uh, for these nodes, the commitments. And the verifier will check if these commitments were correctly opened and if the colors are different. And if this is the case, it will accept. Now, this is a constant run protocol, but it has a huge soundness error. So to drive down the soundness error, we would like to use parallel repetition so that it remains constant round. But then we lose zero knowledge. So we actually use a different protocol. We use the protocol by Goldreich Kahan, which is a modification of the graph three coloring proof as follows. We 
choose the challenges as the very first step and then the verifier commits to its challenge choices. And the rest is basically the same. The verifier will open its challenge now and the prover will check this opening, but otherwise the, the protocol is unchanged. So with this, we can now do an n-fold parallel repetition of this almost standard graph three coloring protocol um, with challenges committed beforehand. And we get a constant round protocol, which has negligible soundness error. And it can be shown that this is black box zero knowledge, but the proof that this is true is somewhat tricky. And we will see the reason in a minute, but before let's look at an alternative security proof, um, which even holds for designated verifiers and expected time verifiers. And the proof is clean, it's simple, but it's wrong. And maybe you can spot the mistake already. So the proof is actually based on the naive simulator. So that's the reason it's simple. It's, it's really the straightforward choice of simulator. Um, this simulator will first run the verifier to receive the commitments to the challenges. It will then send a garbage commitment to all zeros, just so that in the next step, it receives openings of the verifier's challenges. Um, and if the verifier fails in this step, well, the, the simulator can just abort like the honest prover would. So now we have openings to the uh, committed challenges and the verifier, uh, the simulator will now rewind the verifier back to before it sent the garbage commitment. And now it will send pseudo colorings. So a commitment uh, to colors which answer the challenge query correctly, but otherwise are just all zeros. It will rewind the verifier until it answers again uh, with um, a valid opening to the commitments. And if this valid opening happens to, to be different from the opening before, the simulator will abort because now the binding property was broken and the simulator doesn't know what to do. Uh, otherwise, the simulator can just open its challenge uh, coloring and it's fine because it's a pseudo coloring. So now the simulator can run the verify to the end and output whatever the verify outputs. So this is the naive simulator and let's have a look at the security proof. So we use game hops. We start with the honest game, the honest execution. And at the very first step, we will introduce all the rewinding. So it's not hard to see that introducing the rewinding at most doubles the runtime because we have expected one rewind. And note here that we do not compute garbage, commit, uh, garbage commitments here because the commitments and everything else is, is computed honestly here. We, we basically run the, the honest prover with all its inputs, except fresh randomness. In the next step, we abort if the second opening of the challenge um, would be different from the first one. This is not a big change because it can be reduced to the binding property that this happens. And the reduction is actually straightforward here. In the next step, we will replace the first commitment used with the garbage commitment the simulator uses. Again, this is a straightforward reduction to the hiding property of the commitment scheme. And in the last step, we do the same for the pseudo coloring commitments. And here we use that we already know the challenge, um, but otherwise this is again a straightforward reduction. So nothing really happened here, but something went wrong. So did you spot the mistake? And the problem is maybe unsurprisingly that we have a runtime explosion. So let's have a look at a very simple adversary, which will make the runtime explode. And this is an example due to Feige. And the idea is to just run the honest verifier. And in the end, with tiny probability, let's brute force the prover's commitments. And if this verifier sees a pseudo coloring, it will run forever. And otherwise it will output some value D according to some distribution D. So when running with the honest prover, the verifier will be efficient because the tiny probability uh, is, is not a problem for expected polytime V, and it will never see a pseudo coloring. However, if we run this verifier with the simulator, then it might happen that the verifier breaks the commitment scheme and sees the pseudo coloring. And in that case, the simulator would run the verifier to its end, which is forever. And so the simulator itself would run forever. Now there's an obvious solution to this. Uh, we could try to just truncate the verifier's execution. This is not fully black box anymore, but 
it's it's a clear solution, but it doesn't really work um, because if this distribution d is not approximable in strict poly time, then we cannot truncate the verifier to strict poly time. So at least the, the most obvious fix uh, fails. But this can be salvaged um, because Katzenlidell show that using super polynomial truncation and some more techniques, you can actually prove that the simulation works and you can handle expected poly time uh, verifiers. There's also another take on this. Uh, we could say that, well, these designated adversaries are just not worth it and we want that the adversary is, is better behaved. So we could say that the adversary should be expected poly in any interaction. And maybe surprisingly, uh, this also is not good enough uh, because Katz and Adele show that basically due to the rewinding, uh, which happens in the simulation, but never in the real protocol, you can have a verifier which will make the simulation runtime explode, um, but no real interaction, even with arbitrary environments. Again, this can be salvaged and this is what Goldreich does. Uh, he says that the adversary should be expected poly time with respect to any reset attack. So basically, even if you try to make the verifier run very, very long, you will fail. Because it is so well behaved, it, it just will never run for too long. And this, this approach basically says that we do not want to deal with designated adversaries. So this is not the path we take. Um, our path is on a very high level uh, similar to the truncation idea. And before we explain our take on this, uh, we'll simplify the situation more so that we can really see the, the core problems here. And consider this simplified uh, situation where we just have an algorithm A, um, which computes the identity by sampling a random string and in any case outputting X. And this is clearly efficient. Um, so there's nothing problematic here. But this variation here, B, which loops forever if this random string happens to be zero, this is clearly not efficient because its expected time is infinite, for example. But does it really make sense to say that this is not efficient? Because even if we get access to these algorithms as black boxes and we're told how long they run whenever we query them, we could not distinguish them, at least not with a poly number of tries. And this, this is the core problem. Indistinguishability does not preserve efficiency. And we actually saw that not even statistically indistinguishability preserves efficiency. And this leads us to the question, if an algorithm is indistinguishable from efficient, isn't it efficient? And this is the idea which inspired our solution. And in a very abstract view, uh, we can look at it as follows. Uh, we can say that a runtime class, so a set of runtimes, uh, which are by definition efficient runtimes, is distinguished and closed if any runtime which cannot be efficiently distinguished from efficient must also be efficient. Or in formulas, for any runtime u, if there exists a runtime s which lies in t, and u and s are t time indistinguishable, so no efficient algorithm can distinguish u and s, then u must also lie in t, so u must also be efficient. With this, we now turn to our relaxation of expected polytime, which is called computationally expected polytime. And first, we define what we mean by expected polytime more precisely. And now setting things only depend on the security parameter. And a runtime t is expected poly if the expectation is bounded by a polynomial in the security parameter. And computationally expected polytime is now defined as this runtime t is sept if there exists an expected poly time s and t and s are indistinguishable. So I have to remark two things here. We actually use PPT indistinguishability instead of SEPT indistinguishability, but it turns out that these indistinguishability notions are equivalent anyway. And what we use here is not one shot indistinguishability where you just get one sample, but we use repeated samples. So implicitly we mean here T and S um, are indistinguishable given repeated samples because otherwise it, it doesn't really make sense in the setting of, of algorithms which you want to run and which you can run many times because you, you have access to this algorithm and you just want to make sure that it's efficient. 
So this is the natural choice to have repeated samples here. And this definition might not look so nice, um, but we do have a characterization which shows that it's actually a rather neat definition. Um, so this characterization says that T is set if, well, it satisfies the original definition, so there is an expected time S and T and S are computationally indistinguishable under repeated samples. The same holds for statistical indistinguishability, again under repeated samples, which is denoted as PPT query here. And we have a third characterization, which is somewhat different. Namely, there exists a set of good events, uh, which has overwhelming probability, and conditioned on this set of good events, the expectation of T is bounded by a polynomial. This good event characterization is very useful for unconditional things. Um, for example, the introduction of rewinding, um, to see that it does not break sept. Um, whereas the first point is very useful for indistinguishability hops. And actually, we have a lemma which basically just states, restates the usual direct reduction in this designated verifier setting with sept and provides efficiency from indistinguishability in some sense. And in this standard reduction, um, we consider two oracles and a distinguisher D. And now suppose the distinguisher can distinguish O0 and O1 with advantage at least one over poly. And also assume that the distinguisher is sept uh, when running with O0. So we make no assumption about O1. And when we say sept, we only count the steps of the distinguisher. The oracles might not be efficient. Then this lemma says there exists a strict PPT distinguisher A whose advantage is at least 1 over 4 poly. And why does this imply efficiency from indistinguishability? Well, D could basically use its runtime, it, it could measure its own runtime and use this as a distinguishing characteristic. So we see that if D is set, then we could replace it with an PPT adversary, strict PPT adversary, and still have non-negligible advantage. And actually, the proof reflects this. So the proof idea is to just truncate the distinguisher D, uh, so that when running with O0, A and D have statistically close output. So it's at most 1 over 4 poly far. Now, the problem is that the timeout probability um, could be very different when A is running with O1 or O0, but if it's too different, if it's at least 1 over 4 poly far, then again, we get, a, we get a distinguisher by just using the timeout event as the distinguishing characteristic. And otherwise, um, it's easy to see that A still has 1 over 4 poly advantage, and now A is strict PPD by construction. So this is the core result one can use to replace direct reductions. And we will now apply this to the graph three coloring protocol. But first, let's clarify what we mean by zero knowledge in this designated adversary setting. And here, zero knowledge for proof system PV means we have a universal simulator. And we define these two oracles, O0 and O1, where O0 is the honest interaction and O1 is the simulation. And we require that O0 is indistinguishable from O1, which just means that, well, the simulator's output and the real output are indistinguishable. And we also require that O1 is efficient relative to O0, which just means that, well, if the verifier is efficient, so if, if it's an efficient attack, then the simulation must also be efficient, which is the minimum requirement we need for, for efficiency of simulation. And if the attack is inefficient, we don't really care about whether simulation if, is efficient. So this relative efficiency is something which is very natural or which comes, comes naturally in this designated adversary setting. And we'll see that actually we, we do satisfy this um, by going through the proof again. Now we will have a look at the runtime here in this column. And we start with the honest protocol as usual. It is set or apt by assumption because we want an efficient adversary. Now, in the first game, we introduced the rewinding. It can be seen that this preserves apt and sept, and for sept, we use the negligible event characterization. 
In the second step, we fixate the openings. Now here, really nothing of interest happens to the runtime. So this is a very straightforward reduction. In the third step, we use the hiding property to replace commitments by garbage commitments. And we know that apt is not preserved, but sept is preserved. And to, the, and to see this, we can just use the standard reduction. And similarly, in the next step, where we replace uh, the colorings by pseudo colorings, apt is not preserved, but sap is preserved. And actually, what we see here in this chain of reasoning, we started with an adversary which was efficient in the real protocol, and we ended with a simulation which was also efficient. So we actually showed that this works for designated sap adversaries. Now, with the standard reduction, we have provided the first and probably the most important tool in cryptography. Uh, but there's also another very important uh, tool which is used in almost all sec security reductions, namely the hybrid lemma. And we can also transport the hybrid lemma into this designated adversary set setting. Um, and we have formulated it abstractly as shown here. So we write wrap oracle to denote repeated access to, to an oracle, um, which just can be seen as a generalization of repeated sampling. And the hybrid lemma then says that if two oracles are indistinguishable and O1 is efficient relative to O0, then the repeated oracle O0 and the repeated oracle O1 are still computationally indistinguishable and the repeated oracle O1 is efficient relative to the repeated oracle O0. And it turns out that the hybrid lemma is actually not that easy to prove and we will give a very, very high level uh, sketch of the obstacles and the solution. And the obstacle basically is, or the main obstacle is the super constant invocation of relative efficiency uh, is something we, we cannot do. Because relative efficiency comes with a polynomial slack uh, in, in the runtime. So runtime might increase by a polynomial factor, for example. Um, and we can certainly not allow this for more than a constant number of times. Another problem is that the reduction can actually not see the time spent in the challenge oracle, which makes reasoning more complex. And there's a very neat solution due to Hofein's Unruh and müller quade um, who looked at a sort of designated adversary in, in the UC setting for polytime adversaries. And they randomized the order of the oracles in the hybrid argument. Um, and doing this, now all the oracles will have the same runtime distribution. So this kind of solves the super constant invocation because one can now argue with a constant number of invocations of this relative efficiency. And what's very easy to see is one can now watch the runtime of non-challenge oracles uh, to actually approximate the runtime of the challenge oracle. And with this and quite a lot of technical reasoning, uh, one can actually derive this hybrid lemma. So to summarize, we've presented set a small relaxation of EPT. We stated some basic tools uh, which show that one can actually work with SEPT even though it's kind of different from usual notions of efficiency. We showed that one can handle designated SEPT adversaries in SEPT. So now we have symmetric runtime classes for the adversary and the simulator. We make no non-essential restrictions on uh, V star because we consider designated adversaries. And actually now the naive simulator for graph three coloring works even in the Goldreich Kahan protocol, which is quite nice. We can also see that the proof strategy generalizes um, and we do this explicitly in our work. And as the last thing, we should say that we do pay a price because Arguing efficiency can become quite hairy if you cannot rely on the standard reduction or the hybrid lemma. And actually, when proving the hybrid lemma, one, one has to go through quite a bit of technical details um, to see that things work out. And this finishes the talk. Thank you for watching. And you can see the full paper on a print.